Sometimes people ask me who my favorite prose writers are, of whom I have many, and I've noticed that when I answer saying Nabokov or Dostoevsky or Garcia Marquez, even Kurt Vonnegut, people are like, hmm, those are very respectable choices because those are very respectable literary authors. But I've noticed also that when I say Hans Christian Andersen, that reaction is a little different. Most of the time people I think feel um, that I'm throwing that in as a nod to childhood nostalgia or maybe I'm trying to offset the seriousness and uh, literary prowess of the people I've already mentioned by giving a little softer side of me and trying to even out the list. And although both of those things may be true, in all honesty, my appreciation of Hans Christian Andersen is very much an adult appreciation. I've enjoyed his fiction as a child, it's true, but I've really enjoyed it as an adult. And as a writer, I find him to be peerless. I find him to be quite easily on the list with those other people I've mentioned. And many years ago, I was very happy to find this introduction to one of his books that put into words what I've been thinking all along. So let me read you a paragraph from it. Nearly all children love the tales, the tales of Hans Christian Andersen, yet it is a question whether they do not appeal even more to grown-ups. For although the fairies of his mind may have whispered the stories, it was Hans Andersen, the conscious artist, who took endless pains with each until, as he himself said, he was satisfied that it contained nothing a child would not understand. He cast out all difficult or pedantic expressions, all abstractions, and substituted them for the simple, the direct, and the concrete. In seeking this simplicity, he succeeded in doing what every artist is haunted by the desire to do, to turn the material of his art into pure form. That introduction was written by Margaret W. J. Jeffrey, and I think it encapsulates perfectly what I feel not just about Hans Christian Andersen, but also about the best children's literature by avoiding the pedantic, by boiling out the pretentious and the abstract. They are left very often, the best of them, they're left with pure expressions of form in a way that a lot of much more serious work ostensibly for adults is unable to achieve. This grown-up appreciation for children's literature for me is even more so the case in comics where I have, like many other people, often said that some of the best comics I'm reading today, some of the best comics I've read recently, or some of the best comics historically are the ones that were created almost explicitly for children. Every now and then I'll read a work made for children that I think is among the best the medium has to offer. And just such a case is with the subjects of today's video because I'd like to talk about Home Time, written and drawn by Campbell White, which I consider a significant work of children's fantasy in comics or otherwise, and I want to tell you a little bit about why. This story has been published in two hardcover volumes from Top Shelf Comics. One was released in 2017 or 2018, and volume two came out at the tail end of last year, 2020. And this is one of the most unusual and accomplished works of children's fantasy I've read in a long time. Very different in many ways, but similar where where it really counts is Superman Smashes the Clan, written by Jean Luen Yang and illustrated by the artist team of Guru Hero. I found Superman Smashes the Clan to be a terrific all ages work and similar to home time, really expanding the boundaries of the genre, if not the medium, with a story that I think everyone can enjoy. So let's take a closer look at and inside Home Time by Campbell White and Superman Smashes the Clan by Jean Luen Yang and Guru Hero. Campbell White's home time tells the story of six children who've just finished the last day of school. So they're breaking for the summer, which because it's set in Perth, Australia, is also the break for the Christmas holidays. This was the last day of school for them in middle school. When they return, they will all be high schoolers and not necessarily attending the same school as their friends. These six friends are planning a double sleepover, two nights, which will be both a sort of graduation party as well as a birthday party for one of the friends. On the way home, these kids stop by a couple 
couple of different places. We get a lot of their interactions and the chemistry between them. And then an accident occurs in which they fall into a running stream. They wake up in a strange fantasy land populated by all sorts of weird, strange creatures. And the rest of the story is the story of these children and a prophecy that exists in this land in which they will be the saviors as well as their attempts or their quest to get back home. Obviously from the very beginning we can see the touches and influences of stories like The Wizard of Oz or uh, Alice in Wonderland, most particularly perhaps uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe with both them traveling through a portal to another dimension or another plane of existence as well as the prophecy of being the chosen chosen ones or being the ones that will help the creatures that they encounter against some dangers in this magical land. But those tropes of children's fantasy adventures is just the basic bare bones skeleton on which Campbell White hangs a very different approach to something that we may first think as familiar. At the very beginning we spend a fair amount of time with these kids on just a simple walk back home in which the chemistry and the dynamics between them are very clearly established and also the tone of the story is very clearly established. Instead of just trying to push the plot forward, the story is content to spend some time relaxing with these kids. There is a languorousness and it's a sort of meditative approach to their walk. You get glimpses of their city, you get pictures of the neighborhood almost on a aspect by aspect, panel by panel, looks at details that have nothing to do with the children or their dialogue or their interactions themselves. This is just giving us the environment but also giving us the way that the story wants to look at the world, a world that they will soon be leaving. When they find themselves in this other magical kingdom, you first of all have spent enough time with them to see that the different reactions they have are very consistent consistent with the kind of things that we've already seen. Here's the bold, braggy one. Here is the careful one. But you also have a very similar approach to where the details of the environment get their place in the page. Where the focus again is not on just telling you what happens next but giving you time to absorb where these children find themselves. Another departure from traditional children's fantasy is this story's insistence on spending time with the interior lives of these children even more so than it does with the exterior action and decisions. Large chunks of time go by as the story unfolds. We are moving through month after month but very often significant developments happen between the chapters, between the months and when we see these children. Most of the chapters sort of drop you into a brand new context or an adjusted context from what you had seen before. And instead of propelling the story forward within the chapter, we now spend some time in yet more meditative, observational, moment by moment discussions, conversations and emotions rather than the action. This is not to say that the story doesn't have action. There are certain sequences that are just outright violent action sequences. There are other sequences which have to do with a quest and a voyage. But all of these seem somehow much grave and much more serious, the sense of danger and the sense of loss is significantly higher in this work than in many others because most of the time we are spending time with children who are either afraid or retiring into a shell within themselves or full of bravado and trying to explore and get new solutions and new answers. The very significant differences in characters and how much time home time wants to spend with each one of them is what sets this book apart. There's also the phenomenal art in which every chapter is in a very distinct and different style which still has a continuity to it. There's no mistaking the fact that these are the same children, that this is the same environment, but each chapter takes a different child as being the focus, the central focus of that chapter, and the art style changes 
to match that child's personality, that child's outlook on the things around them. The first sign of this is when they slip from reality in modern day Australia into this fantasy land, they go from a sepia toned monochrome sort of thing to a bright burst of color, very similar to the Wizard of Oz movie, which moves from black and white to color once Dorothy reaches Oz. But then each chapter in the fantasy land further refines that look where you can go to watercolors and 8-bit video game looking footage all depending on whose story is being given to us. This constant changing of art style from chapter to chapter is more than just a gimmick. It gets us closer to our protagonists. It really puts us in their shoes and makes us see the world quite literally through their eyes. And each style is breathtakingly rich, matching the world building that is happening on every corner of every panel with a true sense of solidity, even though what you're looking at is colorful cartoons. Even with ideas like every chapter in a different art style reflecting the characters and with the kind of colossal world building that every single part of this universe seems to have, even with these things, Campbell White goes above and beyond what I've uh, at least seen in traditional fantasy storytelling. The world building is expository but happens almost exclusively in detail in diary entries that are between the chapters. So you'll have a chapter in which things happen and you're just being given things and nothing is being explained to you about it. Then you get to the diary entry that both fills in the context of things you've already seen and prepares you for things that you may either see later or never again experience in the comic. It just doesn't come up. It's only in that diary entry. I really enjoyed this technique. One, because it captures the voice of the character, the particular character who's doing those diary entries. It captures their voice very well and it's yet another occasion for a different style to come through with crayon handwriting and a child's journal being the page uh, layout and design. But it also means that whenever you get to a chapter, you just spend time looking at the kids and the way they're thinking and what they're doing rather than the rules of the magic or the rules of the society that they're involved in. This links directly to another intention that this story sticks to throughout is it is interested in how these children react and behave. This is not a gag-filled, jokey story. It's quite serious and it's sad. A couple of these kids just don't want to be here. They're not all, wow, what a magical, wonderful place we've come to. They just want to go home. They miss their family. They miss their parents and they start sinking into depression. They remove themselves from interacting with anyone else, either the kids or the people who populate this magical land they've come into. Other kids lose no time in going native. Parts of that to me felt like the Lord of the Flies where you've got this clinging on to civilization and remember where you came from versus these people who just forget all about it and enjoy a new life. And a very similar sort of thing happens over here where there will be some kids who will continue to wear their clothes even though after months they're falling apart because getting rid of those clothes and starting to wear these new clothes would mean giving up on something that they have uh, left behind or that they've been isolated from. The fact that we spend so much time thinking about what this girl or this boy is going through, why they're angry, why they're sad, why they feel uh, this is something that they don't deserve, what they really want, rather than thinking about the mechanics of this particular piece of machinery or which tribe had which history. The story spending way more time on the interior lives of these children while giving us their surroundings, while giving us their environments in a pyrotechnical display of art and color. The fact that that's the focus and not the look at how many cultures I've created and look at what kind of rules I've created are just part of what makes this such an unusual and such an honest feeling story for children. In fact, I shouldn't be saying story for children because I think I finally understand what all ages reading means, something that I've always taken as a little bit of marketing lingo. But the idea being that it's not 
exclusively for children. The appreciation that I think an adult has for these stories might even outstrip what a child would understand. And again, when I say child, I'm really talking about readers who are at about the same age as these children moving from middle school to high school, eighth grade, ninth grade. Their pain and their fears are as valid as their adventure and excitement. The dangers they face are true dangers and what we see as consequences uh, really do grip us even as adults. The fact that the fantasy vision is so complete yet doesn't want to be at the forefront of it. The fact that these children are so unique and distinct from each other and the way that they interact with each other and their environment feels so authentic and true. And the idea that there is something deeper in this story it's almost an elegy for worlds that we have lost, for history that has gone by. There are ruined cities and crumbling buildings that just are on the periphery of the story and the periphery of the world they're in that leave you with the feeling that this book has a lot on its mind. Just like Pat Grant's Blue, which I talked about in an earlier video, this has a distinctly Australian feeling to it with the slang and the city that you see, but also the way that they interact and talk to each other. There is something about what has gone by and what has replaced it and the themes of a lost fantastical Australia that are tied directly with the loss of childhood, with the idea of growing up and graduating and moving on. There are so many different themes and layers one could keep peeling away from this story that it's one of those books that you know you will return to over and over again. Even if you read it for the first time when you're in 7th, 8th or ninth grade, Home Time by Campbell White, Volume 1 and Volume 2, strikes me as the type of story that you will treasure for the rest of your life. You will revisit it and read it again and find more in it than you did the previous time or you'll find different things in it. And it's the kind of book that I see staying your favorite through your life. Maybe even you being a parent and gifting this to your kids. There's a lot about home time that I'm not getting into for fear of spoiling it. And I don't mean spoiling the plot because as I said, that's not really the main focus of it, although there are some significant twists and turns in it. What I mean is I don't want to spoil the experience experience of discovering the way that Campbell White has chosen to unfold this tale. Where he chooses to provide which details, how he chooses to spend time with characters, to me is a very unusual set of choices that create something in these two volumes that is extremely original and very significant. Home Time and Home Time 2 have my highest recommendation as a very important and very wonderful work of all ages fantasy. Unlike Campbell White, whom I hadn't encountered before, Gene Luen Yang is someone I'm quite familiar with. I've talked a little bit about a couple of his books on uh, some of my other videos, including American Born Chinese on my top 10 gateway comics video made many years ago. And Gene Luen Yang and Guru Hiru are also collaborators on a number of the Avatar The Last Airbender comics. This is also obviously published by DC Comics. This is a big two comic, unlike Top Shelf bringing out Home Time. And to be perfectly honest, although I had heard a lot about this comic, about the praise that it had gotten and the awards it had won, I was a little skeptical. First of all, because I don't read that many superhero comics as regular viewers will know, and I don't enjoy them as much as I used to when I was younger. And also because Superman smashes the clan felt, maybe only from the title, a bit dangerous as in maybe it simplifies something that is an extremely complex thing. Maybe it makes things black and white or makes it an easy solution when we're talking about things that are extremely complicated. However, at the end of the day, the fact that it is Gene Luen Yang whose work with culture and with race has been sensitive and potent in my experience, I decided to give it a shot. And am I glad I did. This to me is also a significant work of children's fantasy. This in the genre of superheroes using a superhero like Superman. And I would go so far as to say is this is what I would like superhero comics for kids. And some would say that all superhero comics are essentially or should be for kids. But again, all ages, it's not for kids, it's for everyone 
this is what I would like superhero comics to be. Not all the time maybe, but definitely most of the time. By which I mean that this is a book that is about hope. This is a book that is about the power of being a hero, of doing the right thing, but it is also not something that shies away from the darker and uglier parts of life. It doesn't pretend that everything can be solved with superpowers and fists. The complexity that this story weaves of a Chinese family in 1946 moving into downtown metropolis, you know, they move out of Chinatown, which is where they've always lived. And again, you've got two kids, a brother and a sister who are on the cusp of middle school and high school. The way that the story chooses to spend time with the children at the time with the interior lives of these children, with the struggles they have with culture, with family, with acceptance, with being an outsider, and most importantly, how this story uses Superman as another outsider, as another alien, not as the person who teaches these children how to be, because this is 1946 Superman. This is how Superman was on the radio show during the World War. This is a completely different take on superheroes, on Superman than I've encountered before, and a marvelous one. Like Home Time, the genius of this story lies in manifold layers, particularly in the fact that both Superman and the children go on a journey of discovery. There is the presence of the clan. It's called the Clan of the Fiery Cross because that's what the original radio show that this story is based on called it because the Ku Klux Klan was a registered official organization at that time and so they had to change the name uh, to refer to them. But the way that they address the presence of the clan in a place like Metropolis, you know, what is this city coming to in 1946, people think of. But also, who populates the clan? They're not some evil superhero sitting in a high-rise tower. They are people right next to you and I, the people who are neighbors and people who are classmates even of uh, the characters in this story. The presence of this dark and ugly thing and the direct addressing of that using superhero tropes and using superhero conventions but also turning them on their head is what gives this story its unique power. Again, if you haven't read the story, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I found it a lovely discovery of Superman as well as of these children. I love the way that it took 1946 Radio Superman and played that into this story of who he was, what he thought of himself, uh, what he is hiding from people, why he has a secret identity, and what that means as far as his powers are concerned, and applied it to immigration and assimilation and cultural roots and embracing a new world in a way that I've seen done before but never with this much confidence and with this much clarity of vision when talking about a real world ugliness like the KKK. And to top it off, this collection comes with an essay by Jean Luen Yang right at the end. I don't know if the individual issues had this and that essay is almost worth the price of admission. He takes the history of the KKK, the history of the Chinese in the United States, uh, West Coast America, Midwest, puts it all together along with autobiography of his experiences growing up and going to school, his father's experiences going to college, into a really powerful but simple and gentle story that I will admit brought a tear to my eye. Both the comic and the essay are amazingly sensitive works that give proper weight and a gentle touch to superhero storytelling in a way that as I said, I would love to see more of. For me, the fan of Hans Christian Andersen, it does my heart good to see works like Home Time and Superman Smashes the Clan because they take the form and put it front and center into the story that they want to tell. It's about superhero comics or magical fantasy land comics. Those are not just vehicles for the story they want to tell, they are the story they want to tell. That distillation down to pure form that both these stories employ make them to me two of the most significant and enjoyable all ages works I've read in recent times. I hope you enjoyed this look at these two books. This has been For the Love of Comics. Thank you as always for watching 
and I will see you at the next video.